At the western end of the Jezreel Valley, in the ancient land once known as Canaan, are the ruins of one of the world's most famous archaeological sites. Known as Tel Megiddo, or simply Megiddo, today it lies within the confines of the modern state of Israel, though in the past it had been part of the many kingdoms and empires that once ruled over this region from the earliest days of the Bronze Age until the end of the Iron Age, a few millennia later. Archaeologists have been fascinated with Tel Megiddo since it was first excavated in 1903. In fact, the site is still being excavated. Part of its value to archaeologists is due to its historical significance. Tel Megiddo was inhabited for over 5,000 years and has witnessed at least 20 different strata, or layers, of occupation. Excavations at Megiddo have unearthed numerous artifacts, as well as the remains of palaces, temples, city gates, defensive walls, and much more. All of these have helped to give us some insight into the daily life, culture, and technology of the ancient peoples who once called this area home. But outside of the world of archaeology, the significance of Megiddo is much different, and to some, terrifying. In the New Testament's Book of Revelation, as well as in popular culture, Megiddo is commonly known as Armageddon, a word that has become synonymous with the end of days. Chapter 16, verse 16 of the New Testament's Book of Revelation states, Then they gathered the kings together to the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. The word Armageddon is the Greek transliteration of the Hebrew Har Megiddo, meaning hill or mountain of Megiddo. What does archaeology tell us about Megiddo? Let's find out. Though inhabited as early as 5000 BC, it's really during the beginnings of the Bronze Age, around 3500 to 3000 BC, that a moderately sized settlement was established at the site that would one day become the city of Megiddo. Along with defensive walls, early Megiddo had several temples, housing complexes, a structure that appears to have been a palace, and cemeteries containing various grave goods and pottery. Other settlements were located nearby, but Megiddo seems to have been the largest and was likely the most important. The city's inhabitants farmed the nearby plains and engaged in trade with neighboring kingdoms, including a fairly large one to the southwest, Egypt. Though there's evidence of contact and trade links with the land of the Nile as early as the 4th millennium BC, it's really after 1550 BC, during the rise of Egypt's new kingdom, that, for better or worse, Megiddo became part of Egypt's growing imperial portfolio. During the reign of the Egyptian pharaoh Ehmos I, Egypt embarked on a campaign to conquer and rule over the city-states of Canaan, including Megiddo. By 1500 BC, most scholars agree that Megiddo was firmly within Egypt's growing empire. Egypt, though, was not the only superpower in the eastern Mediterranean region. To the country's northeast was the Kingdom of the Mitanni, whose rulers also vied for influence in Canaan. Many discontented Canaanite kings and client states were given military aid by the Mitanni kings, with the expectation that they would revolt against their Egyptian overlords, which many of them did shortly after 1460 BC. In 1457 BC, the relatively young pharaoh Thutmose III marched with a large army of perhaps up to 20,000 men to take on a Canaanite force of roughly the same size that had gathered at what was by then the heavily fortified city of Megiddo. Thutmose and his troops reached the city and were victorious in the opening battle, during which many Canaanite soldiers fled to safety behind Megiddo's seemingly impenetrable defensive walls. After a seven-month siege, Megiddo's leaders capitulated and surrendered the city to Thutmose. 
the pharaoh spared its population, but Egyptian troops were garrisoned permanently outside of the city. However, the mountainous terrain, as well as the decentralized nature of Canaan, at times made the area very difficult to manage, and around 1430 BC, several revolts broke out in and around the Jezreel Valley. The Egyptian garrison at Megiddo was not enough to quell the rebellion, and so Thutmose III's son and successor, Amenhotep II, had to personally come with the main Egyptian army to put it down. In a letter from Amenhotep II to Talwishar, the prince of Tanakh, a city just 8 kilometers south of Megiddo, the pharaoh ordered his vassal to do the following. To Talwishar, thus speaks Amenhotep, May the storm god guard your life. Send your brothers with their chariots, and send your quota of horses, and the tribute, and all the Ashiru troops who are with you. Send them tomorrow to Megiddo. If Amenhotep II's later inscriptions are to be taken at face value, then the rebellions throughout the Jezreel Valley and other parts of Canaan were crushed without much difficulty. Megiddo is also mentioned in several of the Amarna letters in which the city's Egyptian-appointed ruler, Biridya, requested aid from Pharaoh Akhenaten to ward off Leayu, the ambitious ruler of Shechem, who according to the letter, had set his face to take Megiddo. Excavations at Megiddo indicate that the city's inhabitants were quite prosperous throughout the Late Bronze Age. Findings from layers, or strata 9 through 7a, which roughly date to this period, include a broad paved roadway, several palaces, relatively spacious houses, and all types of luxury items and artwork, including imported objects made from gold and ivory. It's also clear from the pottery found at these levels that Megiddo had extensive trade contacts with Mycenaean Greece, Cyprus, parts of Anatolia, and Mesopotamia. Like many other cities of the eastern Mediterranean, Megiddo was largely destroyed during the events of the Late Bronze Age collapse roughly between 1200 to 1150 BC. This, though, was the first of many sackings to come. Archaeologists believe that there may have been several successive waves of destruction, including one during the reign of King Shoshenk I, who was the founder of Egypt's 22nd dynasty and took the city during his reign between 945 to 924 BC. Despite such destruction, Megiddo's location at the nexus of east and west was too important to simply be abandoned, and the city rapidly came back to life in the centuries that followed. This includes the period ascribed to the Kingdom of Israel, whose kings ruled over Megiddo and seemed to have invested heavily in the city by rebuilding much of it and transforming it into a prosperous administrative center. However, the city was captured and occupied by Arameans from roughly 845 to 815 BC, and though it went back to the Kingdom of Israel afterward, Megiddo was ultimately taken by the Assyrian king Tiglath-Pileser III, who in 732 BC made it the capital of the Assyrian province of Megiddo. The archaeological record from this time suggests that Megiddo was a well-planned city with spacious residential quarters and large public buildings. Though not all scholars agree, Many believe that Megiddo's drastic decline began in 609 BC, when the Egyptian king, Necho II, fought against Josiah, king of Judah, on the plains just outside the city. Necho had been on his way to aid the collapsing Neo-Assyrian Empire, whose leadership had moved to the city of Carchemish in modern-day Syria. However, Josiah forbade Necho from passing through Judah's territory in order to get there. The two sides fought, with Josiah falling in battle and the victorious Necho continuing on his way to Carchemish. In 605 BC, the Egyptians and what remained of their Assyrian allies were defeated by the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar II 
who not long afterward went on a campaign to conquer the entire coast of the eastern Mediterranean. By 586 BC, he had not only put an end to the kingdom of Judah, but also exiled a significant portion of its population to Babylonia and other parts of what became the Neo-Babylonian Empire. Nebuchadnezzar and later Babylonian kings didn't invest much into the areas that had once been ancient Canaan. In fact, they left much of it in ruins, probably to dissuade Egypt's rulers from trying to seize those territories in the future. Megiddo's population rapidly declined, and perhaps a century later, during the reign of the Achaemenid kings of Persia, the once important city was completely abandoned. So, I hope that you learned a bit about the history and significance of the site of Tel Megiddo. There's lots more on the way, so make sure you're subscribed, and thanks for watching. I'd also really like to thank the channel's patrons for making videos like this possible. These include, but are certainly not limited to, Grandkek69, Yap de Graf, Pasta Frola, Michael Lewis, Daniel Allen, Danny Van Eck, Wenix TV, Robert Morgan, Strobex, Frank, Tim Lane, Sebastian Otato Correa, Michael Trudell, Leader Titan, Micah G, John Scarberry, Andrew Bomer, David R, Stephen Ball, Monty Grimes, Franz Robbins, Cyrus Meir, Diane Astra, Nimrod Nir, Hypno San, Brendan Redman, Faridun Dadachanji, Jimmy Daruwala, Anahita Debu, Gulistan Debu, Sher Cam, Farhad Kama, and all of the channel's patrons on Patreon for helping to support this and all future content. Check out the benefits to being a Patreon member, and if you'd like to join, feel free to click the link in the video description. You can also follow History with Sai on Instagram, Facebook, and X, formerly known as Twitter, as well as continue to listen to special audio programs on the History with Sai podcast. Thanks again, and stay safe.